Good morning. It looks like another dreary morning. Just a little sunshine would be nice, I think. <coughs> Are there any announcements this morning? What? Nobody has anything to say? Oh, Rod, please. All right, take note. Please take note. Hmm. Um, just a couple of uh, announcements. I will be having office hours tomorrow from 8 to 11 o'clock. And then from 3 to 5 o'clock this Thursday. Um, so stop by or call uh, if you like to chat about anything. Um, there is, you should have already received, and raise your hand if you have not, um, a copy of the letter about our anniversary events. Any, everybody get that in the mail this week? Okay, good, good. Uh, we've already gotten 1,200 hits uh, about that announcement and all of our events on our Facebook page because it's being connected to other Facebook pages around the area. Um, so uh, take note of that. Uh, I would like to know, I think we've already gotten a few uh, reservations and paid uh, seats for the anniversary dinner. Um, my advice to you would be sooner rather than later in terms of getting in your uh, reservations with a check uh, for that. Uh, again, pay attention to uh, the letter on that. Um, Rod, I was gonna ask you while we're here, um, I'm assuming that we're going to need a lot of volunteers that can staff the three-day events to do various events, various tasks. Yeah, um, just a little thumbnail sketch as you saw from the anniversary letter um, you know, it, start, it kicks off with uh, an open house uh, and ice cream social on Friday. Saturday is the dinner and a concert uh, by a group out of Owasso that uh, has gospel music. And, uh, and then, of course, we'll have the worship service on Sunday. Um, I expect it's not going to be a one-hour service. <laughs> it's probably going to be at least an hour and a half because there's so much to talk about and testify about. Uh, Steve has already worked with a lot of you already to put in a display about our whole timeline that we've used from our last anniversary celebration. So I urge you to go in and uh, check that out. Um, with that, um, thank you. Before we start the call to worship, I was looking at that picture up there, and I went back as I was, I was looking at that picture, and I went back to Rod and told him, I said, hey, Rod, do you want me to tell you the name of all those people that are up there and what they did for a living and where they lived? <laughs> I thought it was, because that reminds me of the days when we would have holidays, and we'd have to set chairs up in here, and we'd have about 200 people here. So it's very interesting. Our opening prayer this morning. Thanks and praise to you, Jesus Christ, King and Lord of all, given this name above, every other name. Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship you. King of righteousness, king of peace, enthroned at the right hand of God on high. Jesus, king and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Those are the repetition, that's the repetition uh, sentence that you. <clears throat> Great high priest, living forever to intercede for us, Jesus Christ. Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Pioneer of our salvation, you bring us glory. 
through your death and resurrection. Jesus, King and Lord of all, we worship and adore you. Every knee bows to you. Every tongue confesses you are King of kings and Lord of lords. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Our hymn that we're going to sing will be hymn number 465, and there are four verses. Teach me, O Lord, your, your holy way. Next, we will have our confession of sin. God, we know how we sang for joy when Christ came into our lives, and, and how, how we, we have, have not always, always followed him when he leads us on this journey. journey. We have sometimes, we sometimes have hidden our faces from the pain and suffering of the world. We, we sometimes, sometimes have, have turned a deaf ear to the cries of the poor and the oppressed. Forgive us, steadfast God, and shine your face upon us. Help, Help us to have the same mind as Christ, so we would know your promises. Help us have the same heart as Christ, so we might serve your children. Help us have the same spirit as Christ, so we might go wherever he does. <laughs> the next will be the scripture reading. I think I forgot the opening prayer. <laughs> the scripture reading this morning is taken from Luke 5, 1 through 32, the parable of the lost sheep. At my house, I have a picture of the parable that I always remember. It was from my grandparents. Now it's at my house. And I can remember that little plaque with the sheep and beside it. And there's a critter and it's howling. And <coughs> I used to sit on Grandpa's lap and look at that as we rocked. <coughs> Fifteen now. All the tax collectors and sinners were coming to near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them his parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. 
And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. <clears throat> or what woman, have, what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the floor, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. <clears throat> the parable of the prodigal and his brother. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property and dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took the place throughout that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then, one, then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slave, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. We sometimes have hidden our faces from the pain and the suffering in the world. Uh -oh, Luke 5, I better go back to that. 1 through 32. I've read that. 
I did. I did that. Mm -hmm. okay. I've done it. Mm -hmm. I gather up my paraphernalia. Thank you, Mary Lou. Well, a welcome to folks that are watching on YouTube and Facebook this morning. And I don't know, did I say during the announcements, next Sunday, Marsha Farrell will be preaching. She'll be um, giving the message next Sunday, um, taking another week off to uh, recharge the batteries and to um, also prepare for our wonderful 150th anniversary service. Well, Mary Lou had a lot to read this morning, so Mary Lou, thank you very much. Um, this morning in Luke, uh, Jesus unveils for us three crucial parables. Hard to do a sermon on that in 10 to 15 minutes, uh, but nevertheless, uh, he has very wonderful presentations today about these parables. And it, they all kind of, as I look at them from 30,000 foot high view, reminds me about coming home, coming home, and having a reunion of sorts. It also brings me back to a time of 1983. It was a time, it was a year in which I went back to my hometown of Marquette to see my younger sister Allison sing at her senior recital at my alma mater. My sister is a very gifted singer and musician. Uh, I'd love to fly her here for our anniversary celebration and uh, put her to use playing the piano, playing the cello, <laughs> singing solos, uh, just a wonderful gifted uh, sister I have in the, in the area of music. At any rate, I came to watch my sister's recital and I had told my parents at the time that I wasn't probably gonna come back because I was deep in trying to do a good job at my first job out of college sports editor of the Grand Haven Tribune. So I surprised my parents. I came back 30 minutes before that recital started at Northern Michigan University, and I remember vividly in my mind the big smile on my father's face when I walked in and said, hi, Dad, two minutes before my sister went on to do a recital. He gave me a warm, glowing smile. He gave me a warm embrace. It was a look of love. It was a look of pride. It was a look of thankfulness. Got the same from my mother, who was also surprised to see me. I'm glad that I came that weekend to see my sister sing and to see my mother and father. And for one big reason, it would be a year later in which my father would leave this life for the next. So that joy that I saw on his face is something that I will always hold close in my heart. There are other times, of course, where I remember my parents coming when I came home. Uh, Christmas time, of course, opening gifts. Remembering my mother playing the piano as our relatives played Christmas or sung Christmas carols. I also remember back to my father a time where he was playing the guitar. And you could see the big smile on his face as he played and the rest of us tried to keep up out of key. So wonderful times of gatherings and homecomings like that. Today in Luke, the gospel is a homecoming of sorts with these three parables that Jesus gives us. And it's interesting to note today in these parables, the audience in which Jesus speaks about these parables. He's in front of the scribes and the Pharisees, and the scribes and the Pharisees do anything but give a warm welcome to Jesus as he talks about these parables. They're upset with Jesus for a lot of reasons. One of them being is that uh, Jesus has been consorting with tax collectors and an assorted troop of sinners in the eyes of the Pharisees and the scribes. Now, to be fair, the Pharisees weren't always totally at odds with Jesus. Jesus, like them, knew the Torah, the law, the Jewish customs. But here in Luke, the Pharisees and the scribes are astounded at Jesus cozying up with the lowest rungs of society. You see, in that time, tax collectors, well, today too, probably, tax collectors were regarded as what me, 
might call today as imperial pond scum because they collected money from the folks that were occupied by the iron fist of Rome to help Rome and its coppers. And right next to them, the Pharisees and the scribes no doubt looked elsewhere around Jesus as they saw tax collectors and sinners in the midst of that audience that day. They were also pond scum to the scribes and the Pharisees. It's interesting, but you can almost hear and picture the sneer and the sarcasm on their faces, the scribes and the Pharisees, as they ask Jesus, why are you consorting with these people, these unclean Gentiles, not worthy of being around, not worthy of being around God in their eyes, and likely seen by God in their eyes as lost causes? It's here in Luke that Jesus masterfully addresses his opponents and the diverse audience with his favorite teaching tool, the parables. And he puts together an interesting group of people as he teaches with the parables. He presents a parable about a woman who has found a lost coin in her humble home. Now, at first glance, you might think that it's no big deal Losing a coin in a home? Well, in this case, it is. The currency in question, the coin, was the drachma. It's a silver coin worth, in those days, about a day's wages. So that was a big deal to lose a lost coin. A noted biblical scholar pointed out that ten silver coins also made up a Jewish marriage custom in which Those ten pieces of silver were strung together and worn as a headdress. It signified that a woman was married. The headdress was equivalent to a wedding ring in those times. So in other words, to lose a coin from a headdress would be a calamity for any woman of that time. So again, losing a coin in your home was a big deal. Now understand that the home that our woman lived in who lost the coin that Jesus talks about was very modest. She lived in a very modest home. A first century Palestinian home was small and dark. It was illuminated inside by only one circular window about 18 inches in diameter. That's not a lot of light to come into your home. A broom made of palm leaves would have been used to clean the dirt floor of dried reeds. So in other words, finding a coin on that dirt floor indeed would have been like what we would say today, finding a needle in a haystack. Can't you just feel the woman's anxiety? And can't we also feel her joy in finding that coin? And haven't we experienced something like this? Finding a lost engagement ring or a class ring or some other family heirloom? Or how about this? (laughs) I'm not pointing to myself when I say this. Losing your wallet at Disney World. (laughs) Who does that? (laughs) And in the men's bathroom, no less. (laughs) Yep, left my wallet one day in the men's room, right on top of the toilet paper holder, walked away. It wasn't until about four hours later that I noticed that I found it. Luckily for me, the next day I went to Lost and Found, and somebody had found it. It was deposited in a trash can. All the money was there. All the credit cards were there. I was one lucky dude. I had lost something and it had been found. Yep, so if you ever go to Disney World and you lose something, just know that as far as I know, they're still going through all of the garbage bags at the end of the day and finding stuff like this. No doubt the shepherd in Jesus' other parable about the lost sheep wasn't too happy. Some of his flock had been lost. If you remember, shepherds were part of another class of people in society who were not seen by many as high up on the social strata. Shepherds were not way up there. They were not up there to be emulated. Now you may be thinking, what's one lost sheep to a shepherd? Well, a shepherd already has a tough life. 24 hours, seven care, warding off thieves. In Jesus' time, sheep were raised largely, as you can imagine, for their wool. 
and not meat. Wool meant money to feed a family and keep people warm. Losing one would indeed then cause anxiety, a lot of it. Many flocks of the time were owned by one community of people. That means the whole village would be waiting for news about one lost member of the herd being found. Picture the scene then as people heard about Jesus tell this parable of people cheering and smiling and doing thanksgiving praises. Think of the shepherd who walked into the village with the one lost sheep draped over his shoulder and the acclamation he would have gotten at the time. When the people heard these first two parables, you probably might have imagined that someone would have said, okay, Jesus, we get it. People are happy when something is found, whether it's a coin or whether it's a shepherd. But then to put the matter to rest in a wonderful, awesome way, Jesus brings up one more parable, one more story about something that has been lost and gone away and comes back. And in this one last parable, Jesus brings it all home for his assembled audience in the parable of the prodigal son. Now, while following Jesus' words about this parable that Mary Lou read, I'm wondering if you found yourself perhaps very much identifying with the people involved. Interesting perspectives to examine. In the parable of the prodigal son, and from the perspective of the youngest son, I'd be thinking along the lines that I'm bored out of my mind. I am sick and tired of farm life and feeding the pigs, smelling like farm animals. I'm fed up with working long hours in the fields. I want to see the world. I want to see the big city and other countries. I want to see how the other side lives. And so as we heard in Luke to escape, the young son spends his inheritance in advance. Now, you might recoil and say, oh, that's not good. But understand the Jewish law at that time permitted the son to receive his inheritance before the father dies. Yeah, before the father dies. Luke, Luke gives us that. Audacious. Audacious. No, that young son was allowed to have that. Can't you picture the young son who now has left the area, left his father's home? He's out in the big city, the big parts of the country. I'm having a great time, he says. I'm living the high life. Great food, great company, interesting sounds. The young son might have also been thinking, oh boy, this party's over. I'm out of money. I'm hungry. What? Can't find any food around me without money. Guess I better find a job. I hate to tell you this, but the only work I'm good at, the prodigal son might have been thinking, is working on a farm. I'm sure I can go make money at a farm to eat. Oh, geez. Here I am feeding the pigs again, as we hear in Luke. If I don't get paid soon, I'm willing to eat pig food. Home looks better all the time to our prodigal son. He might also be thinking, I miss dad. And I royally screwed up big time by leaving. What was I thinking? I hope dad will take me back. What was I thinking? I hope he'll let me work again on our farm. I'm willing to be hired help. I hope dad will take me back. Now from the perspective of the older brother in the prodigal son parable, perhaps some of you at one time were the oldest growing up in your household. A household of brothers and sisters who over the years saw how, perhaps you saw how your brothers and sisters got better favorable treatment from your parents. And from the perspective of the older son in our parable this morning, what the dad did was incredulous and shocking for so many reasons to welcome back his younger brother. First, did you notice in the parable that the party celebrating the younger son's arrival was already going on when the older son came back from working hard in the field all day. Yeah. He was not even invited to the party, the older son. And then to stand there at the party and see his brother 
wear his dad's ring, robe, and sandals and enjoy a party featuring a fatted calf? Yeah, I think the older son had a right to be upset. I'd be mad and rightfully upset over what dad did. The oldest son had to be thinking, I've sacrificed, I've sweated, I've worked like a dog, and you've never, dad, rewarded me with a great dinner with my friends, and yet you give this to my younger brother? I'm the eldest. I'm the smartest, dad. I've been your rock and all-weather go-to son and picked up the slack after he left, and he turned his back on the family business. And what do I get? The older son must have concluded, nothing. Zip. Zero. And then what do we make of the father in this prodigal son parable? Well, from his perspective, I see unconditional love at work. He welcomes back his younger son, whom he knows has sinned, has fallen short in the eyes of God, and no doubt committed a plethora of bad things while out in the world spending his inheritance in advance. Our father and the prodigal son in that parable, is overjoyed. He's overjoyed that his household has been restored. And from his perspective, he would no doubt welcome back with equal enthusiasm and joy and love if his oldest son, who was so upset right now, had also left and then come back. So after hearing this final parable, where do you think the audience that Jesus spoke in front of saw themselves in this parable, the prodigal son parable. And where do we see ourselves? The younger son could easily, since parables are always, of course, taking people in society, and Jesus uses, of course, the parable as a teaching tool. In this particular case, the younger son could easily be representing the sinners and the tax collectors were in the audience, the ones going about their business and making mistakes, but still there wanting to hear wisdom from God about a new life for them under this kingdom of God that he was only beginning to talk about and realize their shortcomings and then perhaps pledge to have a new life in Jesus Christ. The older brother in this parable, I think, is represented by the status quo. The Pharisees and the scribes in the audience standing before Jesus who can't believe their ears that Jesus is protecting and giving credence to the sinful lot of other people in the audience and offering them a new life. For the established religious order, God does not associate with sinners or welcome them back for that matter. That was something that the Pharisees and the scribes could not swallow. My friends, in all of this, I think we know by now that Jesus is the father who welcomed his wayward, sinful young son back. And there before an entire crowd of sinful people, Jesus, God incarnate, was making it clear that they are warmly invited back into a new life, a new way of living with great love, from God. I think that's important for us to always think about. Yes, we sin, we fall short, and we repent from our sins, but we always, always have welcoming us back into the fold, a God who loves and cares for us so very much, a God who is merciful and loving, a God who waits for us to recognize our broken relationship with God, and waits with great anticipation for us to come back. God is always there. God is waiting to hear our loud voice, our whispering voice cry out, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for leaving, for falling short. Forgive me. Take me as I am. Let us, God, begin anew. There's a wonderful poem authored years ago by James Weldon Johnson that I think speaks beautifully about why God created us as imperfect members of creation that we are. The poem which I'm about to paraphrase goes something like this. God stepped out on space 
God looked around and said, I'm lonely. Oh, make me a world. Then God looked and walked around and seeing all that God had made. And then God looked at the sun and the moon that God had created and looked at the world. He looked, God looked at the world that God had created with all its living things. And then God said, I'm lonely still. I'm lonely. Then God sat down on the side of a hill by a deep, wide river to think. And with heads and hands, with head and hands, rather, God thought and thought until coming back to this decision. I think I will make humanity. As ones created in the image of God, we recognize the need to come closer to our creator every day. God's love for us shines through like that of the father in the prodigal son parable and with his younger son and his older son. God never leaves us when we go astray and wayward. God stares out on the horizon and looks for us to come back, just as the father did for his young son. Christ makes it clear today, too, that there is always a path open and back to again in terms of being in a right relationship with God. Jesus knows we've been dead to sin, but we have gained a new life in Christ through his suffering and his sacrifice and entry into a new kingdom to live in and to help spread that kingdom by our actions and our words. God waits for the lost. God waits for our return. God is full of grace and forgiveness and love. As Jesus tells us, God also rejoices at our return from sin. And finally, I believe that God welcomes the chance to give us the kind of warm embrace and welcome home that the wayward prodigal son got from his father and that this wayward, imperfect son got from his earthly father upon returning many years ago. Amen. Now, would you please join me now as we sing our next hymn? It is hymn number 606. The words are also going to be on the screen. It is nearer my God to you.
Let us pray. God, this morning we gather today grateful of the abundant grace and forgive us you give all of us whenever we do sin and come back to your fold. We thank you for being a patient, understanding, and loving God. God, we celebrate, we grumble sometimes, but we have so much to be thankful for. We are thankful to live in the country that we do. We are thankful for wonderful people that protect us, the police and the firefighters, the doctors, the nurses, the people that work in the hospitals behind the scenes that we never see. We thank them, and we thank all that help us, whether it's someone coming in to fix our house, fix our plumbing, fix our electricity, or bag our groceries. We thank you for all the unsung people in the world. Lord, we thank you too for our men and women in the military who continue to protect us from harm's way and for the people, our men and women that serve in the National Guard as well. We're thankful for our family and our friends. And Lord, we're constantly challenged by this world that you have given us free will over. We pray that you be with us in our longest nights and our darkest days as we endure challenges, whether it be for ourselves or our family and friends. We ask you to reach out and especially comfort those in our midst that are suffering the loss of a loved one, dealing with health concerns. Let them all especially feel your loving touch, God, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And as we look beyond our borders to the rest of the world, we ask you, Lord, to bring peace, peace to the Middle East, to Eastern Europe. We pray for the Russian war against Ukraine to end so that the rebuilding can end. May we always work with our policymakers and people to bring peace in our backyards, peace in our world. Peace, Lord. And Lord, we pause now so that you can hear our own prayers and petitions offered either silently or out loud. Pray for Noah, for Barb, for Vladimir and Alexei and Dennis in the war in Ukraine. You may protect them, God, and their families and relatives. Lord, as you have gathered up our prayers and petitions, gather up now our voices as we say together in unison and out loud the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For the offerings we have received today, please join me in our offering dedication. 
God, we give these offerings in gratitude and in faith, trusting you will provide for our needs. We give these offerings in hope, knowing you can use them to spread your love in this world. And with these offerings, we give ourselves. Amen. Please now join me and rise as we sing our closing hymn. It is in your hymnal, number 495, called as partners in Christ's service. Partners in Christ's service called to ministries of grace. We respond with deep commitment, fresh new lines of faith to trace. May we learn the art of sharing side by side and friend with friend. Equal partners in our caring to fulfill God's chosen end. Reconciling folk on earth, men and women, rich and poorer, all God's people, young and old, blending human skills together, gracious gifts from God unfold. Thus new patterns for Christ's mission in a small or global sense. Help us bear each other's burdens, breaking down each wall and fence. Words of comfort, words of vision, words of challenge said with care. Bring new power and strength for action, make us colleagues free and fair. Friends, give me the honor of sending us home today with this blessing. May we always have our, wa our eyes wide open to the needs of the world and know that when we fall short, we are always welcomed back into the fold by our loving God and his loving son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>